There's no dot. Oh! There it is. Yay, and welcome to Milky Christian Church. We are, for the first time, actually live streaming this using something called vMix, and so um, we hope that this stays, and um, we'll see how, how it works, so prayers abound. Um, it is the first Sunday in September. Um, in other places in the nation, they're approaching fall and leaves start to change, but here we're having the hottest day of the year, and so it's nice to be here in an air-conditioned room, and to any of you that do not have air conditioning, my prayers are with you. Um, stay cool and drink plenty of water today. Um, we have a special picture to show. Janet, can you put that up there? That is little, um, show me, tell me when you got it up there, Janet. Okay, that is little um, Kylie Mae um, Carbajal, and she was born on Friday? Two, Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. She was born on Wednesday. She really wanted to come into the world. Um, she did not, her mom wasn't in the hospital for very long at all. Um, uh, Kylie Mae just wanted to be there. Um, she was 6 pounds, 14 ounces, and I believe 19 inches long. And so um, dad is so happy, mom is healthy, and uh, we counted all the fingers and the toes, and they're all the right numbers. So congratulations um, to the Carbajal family, the Smiths, the Hickson family, um, on uh, our new, the latest uh, Mill Creek Christian little one. Welcome. So, um, other announcements today. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm thinking we would be at the, at the fair and doing popcorn. And so I've been thinking a lot about our caramel corn ministry. And we've got to figure out ways that we can do some of that. But um, I wasn't exactly missing the hot Saturdays in those rooms making the popcorn. Um, so there is something to be said about that. We prepare for worship today as we celebrate, again, another text from Matthew, and um, a pretty tough one today. Let's open in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks today. We give you thanks for this place to come and worship, and this ability to come and hear your word. Open our hearts, that we may hear the message that you have us, living in a world that so dearly needs your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. So we get to start with a hymn, and our hymn today, if you've got one of these hymnals at home, you could read along, sing along with it, but the words will be there on your screen. It is hymn number 323, Wonderful Words of Life.
continue our worship with the reading of the word. And Darlene is going to be reading from Paul's letter to the people of Rome. As Mike said, our scripture is from, uh, well, this one's from Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this one word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and lasciviousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We continue with a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter. This is called the Matthean Law. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in his name, I am there among you. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, so this message today, the Matthean Law, it's important to have some setup for this one. Um, to begin with, Matthean would indicate that it's the Gospel of Matthew. And so Matthew was the second of the two Gospels that was written, uh, we believe. The first Gospel, uh, commonly people refer to Mark as the first Gospel. It was one that was given that you could tell at one time as a story sit down with your family and start right at the beginning and go through it. And Mark has that kind of feel to it that you want to keep going and you want to keep going. And the story speeds up until you get to about Jesus going to Jerusalem and then it slows down as the journey to the cross continues. It's believed that Ma Matthew, the writer of Matthew, knew that text very, very well. Um, he may have even had the text in front of him as he wrote his own gospel because almost every verse of Mark is contained in the Gospel of Matthew. There are just a couple verses from Mark that are not in Matthew. And then Matthew expanded on Mark's text, because Matthew's uh, audience were his fellow Jewish people. He was very much looking at the people of the tribe of Israel as his audience to bring them in as Christians. And so again and again you'll hear in Matthew's text, this was done in order that the scriptures could be fulfilled. That's a sign that that's a Matthean text. And this is a concept, this very idea, is a concept that is borrowed from uh, the Jewish world that Matthew knew. This idea of trying to stay together as a church, as a community. There were certain rules involved in being in a community, just as we have 
rules. Uh, you might say, I, I know I've heard a number of times from my mom or my dad, that's not how a Sutherland behaves. Um, and there were rules of how we are supposed to behave in order to be a part of the family, to have that name. You know what I'm saying. When we did things and um, a neighbor might say, hmm, your dad will hear about that or your mom will hear about that. And sometimes that would mean a timeout. Well, that's what this text is talking about. Bad behavior within a community and how should we deal with it? The very first step is probably the most important one, and it's the one that as human being, beings we fail at the most. Because usually when we see someone's bad behavior, we don't go to that person. We tell somebody else about their bad behavior. And how does that help the person whose behavior is bad if all we're doing is setting them up for failure? Instead, we're supposed to go to them alone and speak with them one on one. You know, it's amazing the way we form memories. Um, I was thinking about this story that I wanted to share with you today. And it's pretty clear that I have told this story from the forming of my memory, but it didn't happen the way I have it in my memory. What I'm talking about is an event that happened in my first year of seminary, and it had to do with the President of the United States at the time, one William Clinton, and how he told that lie to the world. And I can remember when he told the lie, listening to it, fully in my heart, I knew he was lying to me. And I remember saying to a friend, and as I would tell this story to others, I had always said that I told this to my dad. But my dad had been gone for years by this point. So I guess it was the fact that the way that I heard it was so embedded on me as a member of the Sutherland family, as a member of the clan that I was of, that I heard my father answer me in that. I remember hearing or saying to my friend who lived next door, he had better not be lying to me. And just the look of my friend back to me going, he just looked, and I knew what he was saying is, you know he is. But the wisdom that I also heard from my father in that moment was the one that will always stay with me. He said, Michael, if you ever make somebody else lie, you're no better than they are for lying. And what he meant by that is, there are times where we can put somebody on a spot in public, asking them a question that we know the answer to, and we know that it's going to embarrass them. And they have an opportunity there to either be embarrassed or to lie. And if I do that, then I am no better than they are when they lie. Different kind of sin. And that's what this one is trying to take care of. It says, go to a place where there's just you and them. And that way, when you face it with them, they're not having to deal with the embarrassment in public. They can deal with it there. You can coach the words in such a way that you can even say, I know the truth to this question, and I know this has happened. We need to talk about the behavior. Now, it's clear there's a way to step through this and step through this and step through this. And, and there are times when as we are being critiqued, as we are being walked through a process of being the outsider, we become stubborn. We um, can't even face up to the fact that we have done this because we've got justification and we've got all kinds of reasons why we did what we did. And we don't necessarily see it the way the others do. Or maybe we just plain disagree with the rule. Well, as that happens and more people are gathered around, I want us to remember that the goal of this is not punishment, but reunification. The idea that we try to say so often in this congregation, we like to do things so that we have a common agreement. We don't always have to say yes to everything, but at least we can say, I can accept that as what we'll go forward with. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do when maybe three people gather together. You'll notice that it says that when two or three are gathered together. 
What's trying to be done there is to be bringing in the spirit of the Lord in such a way that all the hearts in the room are in agreement. But that doesn't always happen. And I know that over the course of my life, there were some times where I strongly disagreed with the church. And I was called to task for that. And at one point, it became clear that in a certain denomination, I needed to be put out of that denomination. And I chose to go. I chose to no longer remain silent, no longer to accept the rules as they were, and to say this was not a place for me. Now, for our society, there's still life after that. We can move on, and we do miss some of the people and, and some of the rituals that were involved in it, but our life doesn't necessarily end. Not so much at the time of Matthew and his writing of this. Because if you were put outside the synagogue or put outside the church in the time of Christ, there were many, many things that you were not, that you could no longer avail. It was a case where now all of the ritual cleanliness, all of the temple visits, all of those things that you would receive from the church, i.e. atonement, at one minute, as we like to say sometimes, weren't offered to you. You were no longer a clean person. And that meant that, that as uh, living in the village that you lived in or the town that you lived in, you would be shunned by many people. There were some places you probably couldn't shop. There were things that you couldn't do. And it could absolutely impact your livelihood. That's why Matthew is making this such a big deal. He's saying we have to have a vehicle for bringing together those people who are walking outside so that we can continue to have a village that thrives and people thriving in it. So we get the idea of the rules, and, and this rule has been used by not just church bodies, but a, a number of uh, corporations have adapted this same kind of policy as how do we enforce rules so that we are safe to the person who is walking outside of the rules and to the community that we're trying to bring them back into. But Jesus adds some extra stuff to this at the end that I think is important to raise up. It says here at the end, Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. I like that they say he uses the same phrase Matthew does two or three as he does to start the issue two or three. Because when we move from that very first step of one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, they sometimes say, there can be at times a tension there. A tension of, well, I'm just going to, all I have to do is stay strong for this one person and I will, and I'm going to hold my ground, stay my case. Here I stand, I can do no other, as a very stubborn Luther once said. And so then you part, and this is where that next part is so important. Two or three are asked to come in the room. And you would hope that before they came in the room, that the rule that was done is before I talk to my friend about Christ, let me talk to Christ about my friend. And that those two or three would have gathered in prayer, had prayed over the issue, and with that sentiment, come forward and talk. Consensus can then be formed. I'm really blessed at this church that I have a pastor's committee that does that kind of work for me. Because heaven knows, um, we deal in a world of imperfection and there's lots of times where we stumble along and can do some things. And it's good to hear feedback about how things are going. And I have this committee that brings forward some of those things Sometimes when they say, Pastor Mike, this could be better. You see, I know that when they come into that room and they bring me into that room, that they've also prayed about it ever before they ever come there. I know that because when things are presented, I can hear the tone of the presentation is one of prayer. And that is what helps us to then know that as we walk through the process, it is spirit-led. I was watching a show the other day, and this story
story just jumped to mind to talk about this text. It says that there was a man that was walking around one day and he wasn't paying attention to where he was going and he fell into a pretty deep hole. And as he fell in, he kept yelling and yelling for help. And um, as it would happen, the very first person that came along was a doctor. And he said, doctor, help me. I'm stuck down here. I need help. And the doctor whipped out his prescription pad. He wrote him a prescription and he threw it down to him. Hmm. Well, a little while later, a pastor came walking by. And he yelled up to him, Pastor, Pastor, I'm so glad you're there. I need your help. And with that, Pastor got down on his knees, wrote out a beautiful prayer, read it to him, and then threw it down into the hole to him. <laughs> a short while later, one of his best friends came walking by. And as he looked down in the hole, he yelled up to him, Oh, Bobby, you're here. I need your help. And with this, Bobby jumped into the hole. And he looked at him and he said, You fool. I can't believe you did that, Bobby. Now we're both down here. And Bobby looked at him and said, yes, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. Excellent. You see, that's the spirit that Christ wants us to have when we go into that room with that one person. So often when I read this text before, I kept thinking of it as being, I know what's right. And I need to get that person to be right also. Orthodoxy is what's read into that. That there is a way to do things and I need to make sure I tell them how to do that. And you notice the way that is in terms of a scale. The reason I love this story of the man in the hole is we all stumble in our lives. We all at times are stuck in that hole. And the last thing we need is somebody holier than us praying down on us or however you want to look at that. We, you know, how, how much more beautiful it is that there's somebody that has been there before us and knows the way out. You hear the difference in the way that is said is how I now hear this text. Go into a place with them alone. And if you win them, then you have the words on here were restored them. Bobby jumped in the hole because he knew that his friend was frightened down there. He'd been there before. But he also knew that there was a way out. And perhaps in the darkness and the mess and the fear, this person was there looking anywhere but where the right answer was. In our world today, there are many people who are trying to figure out how they can live and be part of a community in this time and space. A dear friend posted yesterday on Facebook, in bold letters it says, I am an introvert. That doesn't mean I'm shy. That doesn't mean I'm afraid of crowds. This is not something that is a disability. It is who I am. And I thought, how beautiful. It is so true that um, usually in the world, that's what we're looking at when we know an introverted person, that they don't get their strength from being around folks. They get it by being alone. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's who they are. But where I've really been able to understand that these days is that the world now with 2020 and COVID has been turned upside down. And it's like now the world is made for introverts. And us extroverts are really trying to question what's going on in the world. Because I'm anything but shy. <laughs> There's, you know, I've never been accused of being shy. I love having people around me. That's what I feed off of. But right now, those people aren't around. And I find myself at times in the isolation, wondering, am I losing it? The good news is that I avail myself to friends and I share about that. I'm able to say that my world is not complete right now. And I need some kind of way of doing the extroverted things that I did before without the touch or the hug. Um, and there are many people that, uh, that's one example, the extrovert. But there's others as well. Like I'm thinking of the single parent. 
that's trying to be a teacher and a worker and a mom or a dad to a child that is looking for where are my friends and how do I keep focused on this teacher on the screen. Our world is not an easy world right now. And we need more and more moments where we can, before the crisis even happens, reach out to that friend one-on-one -on -one and say, tell me your story. Let me know where you are. This week I really do encourage you. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to share this story, but I'll end with this. Last night in my home, um, my neighborhood exploded and I did not even know. Um, I was very busy trying to work on the Disney puzzle because it has got me and um, it is one way that I can focus on the word and figure out my message. I just work with those little pieces and I was so absorbed in it, I did not even hear what was going on outside my door. And it wasn't until it was mostly over, as I shut down uh, my iPad and I turned off the light, I heard screaming outside. My neighbors were at each other and it was not good. And um, as I walked outside, I noticed that there was a gun. And um, all that I could think of was to yell a name. And I yelled the name of one of my neighbors whom I love very much. And it just shut all the noise off. And then I said, get in my house. I knew that my home was safe and I wanted to be in it. But I brought him inside as well and his wife came along. I felt that we did this. In the safety of my home, we were able to just talk and say, what's going on? Um, we stayed inside for probably 15 minutes. I know that there was still noise outside. But at that point, um, I walked them across the street to their home, and then I went back in. Um, all that to say that there are times when there are going to be, there's going to be tension and there's going to be concern. And I just did what I was taught from a child. Time out. Let's take a time out and get to a place of safety and give that person a chance to, the word I think we use in business all the time, is vent. To safely just say, this is where it's at. This week, you probably see examples of that someplace. And maybe the first thing you can do is say that prayer. Calm your own heart down. And then if you can establish eye contact with the person, just give them the best gentle smile you can to let them know that you hear their pain and um, give them some space. Our world is going to get, oh, well, crazier before it gets better. Um, we're in for some more warm weather, but the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting cooler. Um, let's hope that our tempers can do the same. As we go forward, continue to pray for our world and for those that are in it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We are very blessed today to have Erica singing for us. And so um, she has a beautiful song, and I'm going to turn the screen over to her now.
One of the things that would happen when you were no longer part of the community, sometimes the word that would happen to you was called excommunication. It meant that you were not allowed to come to this table. Something I would always struggle with, to think that why, why would we possibly deny the very meal that can save to someone who is in need of saving? Because it was on that night in which our Lord was betrayed that he blessed the bread. And having blessed it, he broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body. It is given for you to this in remembrance of me. And then afterwards, he took the cup. And having blessed it, he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this banquet that you have so freely given us. We carry in our hearts the riches of this eternal goodness. May we pour it out wherever we go, lighting up the darkness with truth, speaking out hope where there is despair, and weaving your unconditional love into all we do. Send us now in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. May we live to be all that you have desired us to be. Amen. Now let us continue with the prayer our Father taught us. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Christy. These are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God. And so wherever you are, as you are sharing now, take a piece of bread. As you receive it, the body of Christ given for you. Take your wine or your juice or whatever it is that you have. And share that as well, the blood of Christ shed for you. Come, for all is ready.
We have rather a special treat here today. Um, this was something that I saw in Pastor Heather's post where she had some pumpkin donuts with uh, a little bit of grape juice in the middle of them. And so we shared that today as the worship team. Just a little something special for this team that was here gathered to, um, together in worship. So we go into the world, and one of the prayers I know that is on many of our hearts is to pray for those who are in harm's way fighting these atrocious fires in our state and around us. And so we'd ask that um, you would lift up those that are um, on the front lines, the firemen and women that are out there, and, and also just um, a, a lift to lift up all of those who are um, you know, doing so much for us. And you think of our men in blue that have this added burden right now as there is so much anger in our streets. We ask that um, what we can do to calm that helps them out um, as much as, as um, all of the other debate. Keep them in your prayers, but also keep those um, in prayer that need, need so much to just um, calm the situation down. We go into a world now that is in need of that kind of love and support. And so go there fully knowing that the Lord will be with you as you pray. Receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go out singing, and the song that we're singing today is In the Cross of Christ I Glory. It is hymn 207, and we are going to sing all four verses. My goodness.